Good morning. Welcome to worship this morning. What a joy it is to gather on this beautiful day as a family of faith to worship. So as we gather, let's kind of breathe in and breathe out and feel the presence of God among us as we hear the ringing of the bell. Please stand as we sing together. to be people of God. We gather in joy-filled celebration of our creating God. We celebrate the godly miracles of creation. We experience every day and night. Called to be people of faith, we gather to praise our eternal and loving God. Faithful God, we gather to give our thanks that your promises are totally reliable. Called to be a people of hope, we gather to give thanks for God's care and compassion towards people who are vulnerable to life's fears and stresses. Justice-loving God, we give thanks that your love and mercy are the source and power behind God's commitments to the created world and towards all humanity, and especially towards vulnerable, dispossessed, and isolated people in our midst. Amen. The peace of Christ be with you always. And also with you. Let's share a sign of God's peace with one another. As you return to your seats, I invite you to sing with us, He is Exalted as printed on the screen.
grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. Let us pray. O God, rich in mercy, you look with compassion on this troubled world. Feed us with your grace and grant us the treasure that comes only from you. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Good morning. First scripture this morning comes from 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 6 to 19. Of course, there is great gain in godliness combined with contentment, for we brought nothing into the world so that we can take nothing out of it. But if we have food and clothing, we will cont be content with these. But those who want to be rich fall into desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. And in their eagerness to be rich, some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pains. <clears throat> Excuse me. But as for you, man of God, shun all this. Pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, endurance, gentleness. Fight the good fight of the faith. Take hold of the eternal life to which you were called and for which you made the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. In the presence of God who gives life to all things and of Christ Jesus, who in his testimony before Pontius Pilate made the good confession, I charge you to keep the commandment without spot or blame until the manifestation of our Lord Jesus Christ, which he will bring about at the right time. He who is the blessed and only sovereign, the King of kings and Lord of lords. It is he alone who has immortality and dwells in unapproachable light, whom no one has ever seen or can see. To him be honor and eternal dominion. Amen. As for those who in the present age are rich, command them not to be haughty or to set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches, but rather on God who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. They are to do good, to be rich in good works, generous and ready to share, thus storing up for themselves the treasure of a good foundation for the future so that they may take hold of the life that really is life. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We'll read Psalm 146 responsively. Alleluia! Praise the Lord, O my soul. I will praise the Lord as long as I live. I will sing praises to my God while I have my being. Put not your trust in rulers, in mortals, in whom there is no help. When they breathe their last, they return to earth, and in that day their thoughts perish. Happy are they who have the God of Jacob for their help whose hope is in the Lord their God. Who made heaven and earth, the seas, and all that is in them, who keeps the promises forever. Who gives justice to those who are oppressed and food to those who hunger. The Lord sets the captive free. The Lord opens the eyes of the blind. The Lord lifts up those who are bowed down. The Lord loves the righteous. The Lord cares for the stranger. The Lord sustains the orphan and widow, but frustrates the way of the wicked. The Lord shall reign forever, your God, O Zion, throughout all generations. Hallelujah. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I invite the children to come forward um, as we sing together this little light of mine. This little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. Let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. Okay, I've been thinking about this this week. 
I got this basket of candy here. I said, I'm not going to share it anymore. Nope, it's just going to be all mine. Huh? Well, you know, I, I used to work with little, really young kids, and their, their favorite word was mine. This is mine. I don't want to share it. It's all mine. No? Well, why can't I just have it all? It's all mine. Do I, am I supposed to share it with you? Yeah. Well, who says I'm supposed to share it with you? Oh, God says, oh, we got another preacher in our midst. God says I'm supposed to share it with you, right? Because is that what we're taught, to be a disciple of Jesus, to be a disciple of God, that one of the things that we're taught is to share with others, right? Yeah, that's a pretty important lesson, that sharing. And sometimes it's kind of hard, even when we're big people, to share. But that's what God calls us to do. Because when we share, we find out there's enough for everybody. And not only that, we make new friends and we build better relationships. But sometimes, because it's so hard, we just need God to help us. So how about if we pray today that God helps us share? God, you do call us as disciples of God to share what it is that we have been blessed with. And sometimes, God, that's really hard, whether it's our toys or our candy or even our time. So, God, just, just help us to share so that we can not only show your love, but build relationships with those around us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, then I will share my candy. Everybody can have a piece, and in fact, take two, and I want you to share one with somebody along the way, okay? One for you and one for somebody else. You get to decide who you want to share with today. Please rise for the acclamation. Okay, just to let you know, Richard, I forgot to tell you. I'm using the secondary mic today, so if you're working volume, that's why it's weird. Luke 16, beginning with the 19th verse. There was a rich man who was dressed in purple and fine linen, who feasted sumptuously every day. And at the, his gate lay a poor man named Lazarus, covered with sores who longed to satisfy his hunger with what fell from the rich man's table. Even the dogs would come and lick his sores. The poor man died and was carried away by the angels to be with Abraham. The rich man also died and was buried. In Hades, where he's being tormented, he looked up and saw Abraham far away with Lazarus by his side. And he called out, Father, Abraham, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus to dip the, finger, the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am in agony in these flames. But Abraham said, Child, remember that during your lifetime you received your good things and Lazarus in the like manner evil things, but now he is comforted here and you are in agony. Besides all this, between you and us, a great chasm has been fixed so that those who might want to pass from here to you cannot do so, and no one can cross from there to us. He said, Then, Father, I beg you to send him to my father's house, for I have five brothers, that he may warn them so that they will not also come into this place of torment. 
Abraham replied, they have Moses and the prophets. They should listen to them. And he said, no, Father Abraham, but if someone goes to them from the dead, they will repent. He said to him, if they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, neither will they be convinced, even if someone rises from the dead. The word of the Lord. You may be seated. Grace and peace to you from God, our Father, and from Jesus the Christ, our Savior. Amen. Stay away from those mics and we'll all feel better. <clears throat> Warning. This is another one of those verses that makes you a little uncomfortable in your seat. Luke is continuing to follow up from last week, being surrounded by the Pharisees, the lover of money. Last week, he warned us about worshiping mammon instead of God. And this week, we hear another warning from Luke. We hear a warning between a rich man and Lazarus. Now, for some of us, we might wonder what it means to be the rich man because, you know, I don't wear purple much all the time. My bank account doesn't look so great. In fact, it looks pretty bad. However, I was reminded as I was visiting with, a, um, with another pastor this week who takes the kids on the mission trips and works with Red Shirt and others at one of the mission trips last summer, one of the, the young people was saying, well, I'm not rich. You know, I don't have blah, 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 blah. And my friend does. And Larry looked at him and said, do you have food on the table? Better yet, do you have food in your cupboards? How about in your pocket, in your wallet, or your purse? Do you have at least some coins, if not a dollar bill? Do you have a place to sleep tonight that's inside and at that point in time in July cool? Yes, you are rich by 90% of the world's population would consider you rich. But then on the other hand, we don't really want to be Lazarus either. We don't want to be, think that we are poor and, and covered in sores, lying at the gate, looking at the rich man unseen by those around him. You see, Luke uses these huge contrasts in this parable today to open our eyes, to get us to see so that all of God's children might have life and have it abundantly so that all of God's children might be seen. As human beings, we want and we need and we crave boundaries in our lives. We are taught as parents when we raise our children, we, they need to know their boundaries so that they know where to live and how to live. They need structure, they need guidance, and we want that as adults as well. We want to know what our place is, what's expected of us. And we want to know the place of others as well. And then we tend to do what we can to keep ourselves and to keep others in those places. Our place dictates how we dress, how we act, what we eat, what we say, our education, our jobs. And if we try to step out of those places to leave those boundaries, we get bullied, frowned upon, intimidated, and chasms are created. And pretty soon, those people become unseen. Lazarus and the rich man. I am fairly convinced that this parable this warning that makes us squirm in our seats is not about the afterlife. 
This is the only place that Luke ever talks about Hades. I am fairly convinced that Luke is addressing our lives now. The chasm that is fixed between the rich man and Lazarus, it isn't new. You've seen it like the whole time. That chasm was fixed a long time ago and reinforced every time the rich man came and went into his sumptuous abode to feast at his table. You know what? Every time he ignored Lazarus. He obviously knew him. He called him by name. He knew his plight. But yet, he did nothing. And in fact, Luke says, even in the afterlife of this parable, the rich man continues to treat Lazarus as a non-entity, a no one, a nobody. Get me a drink. Fetch me this. Go and talk to my family members. Be a messenger. In both his earthly life and in the life to come, the rich man refuses to see Lazarus as a person, a human, a fellow child of God, and so ignores him and ignores his plight. And seeing in this gospel is a very big deal. Because before you can have compassion for people, you have to see them, acknowledge their presence, acknowledge their needs and gifts, and above all, acknowledge their status as a child of God, worthy of respect and dignity. And the rich man, he fails to do this. This parable describes an afterlife which is the same as the one that existed for both of them when they were alive. For no good comes from setting barriers between the children of God. And I think this is Luke's point all along. It's less about warning punishment in the next life and it's more about urging us to the abundant life in this one this life that we're living now that comes only in seeing those around us as God's beloved children, deserving our care and our attention and our fellowship. To have abundant life is to be in relationship with all of God's children, not just those who are safely in our box. I have to be honest with you. This lack of seeing truly scares me today. This blindness to others who are different or who we don't understand, who are not in the same place as us, leads us away, I feel, from living our lives as children of God. Be honest with yourselves. Who is Lazarus for you today? Who are the unseen that you walk by for a number of reasons? Who are those people? Are they the ones that dress differently? Or talk differently? Or eat different foods? Do they have different beliefs or different skin color or different sexual orientation? Are they the immigrants or the refugees who are forced to flee from their homes because of bombs or famine or torture? Whose lives are ones we can't even imagine living, but yet we can offer them no place of welcome? Is it the quiet child who simply wants to blend into the woodwork, hoping to make it through another day without being bullied, without being hit, without being screamed at, with at least one meal, not even expecting anyone to see him, and surely not expecting a a kind word or a loving touch? 
Can you see me now? I don't think that the unrepentant but chastened rich man is the true subject of this parable. I think we are. We are those who, along with the community for whom Luke originally wrote, know the resurrected Lord. We know someone who has risen from the dead. We are the ones who have the law of the prophets We have God's word written in our own language. And we have seen God's compassion embodied in the life and ministry of Jesus. We are the ones who gather each week to celebrate the victory over the grave, forgiveness of sin, and the possibility of living in the light of God's grace and mercy and abundance. We are those who follow the crucified and risen Lord. All of which brings me to think, to what I think as Luke's central question. So, is Abraham right? Does any of this make a difference? Does our faith in and experience of the risen Lord help us see those we would prefer not to see and regard those around us as worthy of compassion, respect, and honor? or not? Does the testimony of the one who conquered death and called us to follow him make a difference in our lives? Now, just to be clear, I don't think Luke is saying that how we answer this question will determine our eternal destiny. I think he's more interested in whether or not that shapes our lives right now. Because Luke knows that we simply cannot live into the abundant life God offers us here and now alone. Abundant life comes via community. When we see those around us as gifts of God and experience the blessing of sharing what we have with others, There's a reason that generous people are more happy than stingy ones. God created us to be in relationship with those around us, and we experience the fullness of the life of God intends and offers only when we embrace the people God has set in our path. The parable isn't about earning or relinquishing an eternal reward. It's about the character and quality of our life right now. Eternal life for Luke isn't a distant reality. It starts now. Each time we embrace the abundant life God offers in and through those around us. So while it certainly is a warning not to look over, overlook those in need, it's also an invitation to live into fuller, more meaningful, and more joyous life by sharing ourselves, our time, our talents, and certainly our wealth with those around us here and now. For as we do, we live into the life and kingdom God outlines in the law of Moses clarifies in the prophets and makes manifest and available to all in the life, death, and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. When we open our eyes and when we see people, when we embrace people as children of God, no matter what, our lives become more abundant Our relationships grow, and we live as disciples of God. Amen. We have one slight change in our program this morning that happens when the pianist calls at 8 o'clock and says, I'm sick. And Joan is going to fill in for me. 
or it's probably closer to 8.30 for Joel. <coughs> so um, instead of singing um, 10,000 Reasons, uh, we are going, I'm going to invite you to grab your red hymnal and turn to number 638 in your red hymnal as we sing Blessed Assurance. Please rise. Blessed assurance Turning together in trust and hope, we confess our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. Before we gather our offering, I just want to give an update on how I have seen the love of God flow through you and how you have opened your eyes to see someone. Last week, we took a special globe offering for a young lady that LSS had made us aware of. And this congregation gave over $500 um, to help this young lady. And I apologize for not getting an email out. I'm still going to try to do that. So I was able to deliver a whole lot of stuff um, not only walking the aisles of Walmart and getting all of those paper products and cleaning products that you can't get with an EBT card, but taking a recliner and dishes and some other things to um, Jessica to be delivered. At this point in time, um, we're not gathering any clothing for the young lady, um, and we're not introducing anybody new to her. She's still developing trust with adults. So I'm just strictly working through her social worker. But thank you. Thank you for your generosity in being able to see one of the unseen and to help her to have hope again and to get her feet on the ground. And not only that, thank you to everyone who helped with and took part in some way, shape, or form in Chuck's service yesterday. Um, your generosity overflowed once again. So as we gather our offering, thank you. Thank you for being a generous <gasps> congregation.
Let us pray. Please rise. Rejoicing in the Spirit's work among us, let us pray for the church, the world, and all those in need. God, we thank you for the church, its mission, and its ministry. Help us be examples of the faith and to pursue righteousness in all we say and do. Lord, in your mercy. We pray for the well-being of all creation. Make us wise stewards of your rich and beautiful world. Lord, in your mercy. Ruler of the nations, we pray for peace in places of conflict and war. We pray for exiles, refugees, and those far from home. Lord, in your mercy. We pray for all those who are lonely or homebound, those who are trapped in any kind of prison of body, mind, or spirit, and those who are sick or injured. Today we lift up to you Jess and Cal, Judy and Randy, Monty and Mabel, Vern and Daryl, Melinda and Shell, Gloria and Cindy, Jack and Tony, John and Roger, Shanna and Dawn, and Bernie and those we name in the quiets of our hearts. Lord, in your mercy. God who sits on high but looks low, we pray for our brothers and sisters who struggle to make ends meet. Provide for all of our physical and spiritual needs. Lord, in your mercy. We remember and give thanks for all your saints in light and for those who have recently died, including Mary and Chuck. Thank you for the good foundation of their lives and witness. Lord, in your mercy. Into your hands, O God, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy through your Son, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Just a couple of things I'd like to point out. One change that's in the bulletin was on the calendar. I will not be heading to Fall Theological Conference in Pierre today. I will be around. Um, I have been asked to officiate at Mary Robertson's funeral on Tuesday morning at the UCC Church. Um, so I'll, I'll be sticking around. And please keep that family in prayer as they continue to walk, um, to walk that path. And potluck after church, you're invited to come down and join us. If nothing else, I happen to see a whole lot of desserts downstairs. So what the heck? <laughs> so um, before we receive the benediction, because we are all gonna, you know, eat somewhere, let's pray the table prayer together. Come, Lord Jesus, be our guest, and let these gifts to us be blessed. Amen. And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. May the Lord look upon you with favor and grant you his peace. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We sing together number 538. The Lord now sends us forth.
Go in peace. Serve the Lord. Thanks.